Harry Watcher's work, The Drop Sinister, What Shall We Do With It?, is a departure for Watcher's, an exploration of the moral and social issue that dominated his day. How were whites and blacks to live together in a new post-slavery world? Watrous was a child during the Civil War. His life was lived in the shadow of a society struggling with the question of race. The struggle was one that was felt on a national level, on a community level, and in homes across the country. For some, the racial struggles of the early 1900s was deeply personal, a battle to come to terms with their identity in a nation that denied them personhood. When a nation officially determines that one drop of black blood means you are a Negro and condemns you to a life on the sidelines, how does a black or mixed race child process that? Is it any wonder that a white child internalizes the message that their blood is somehow pure? And so the debates raged. Power, wealth, and position were at stake. The Civil War ended slavery, but ushered in a new era, fraught with tension and division over the quote-unquote, Negro problem. Sides were taken in Congress, opinion pieces were written in newspapers, fiery sermons preached in America's churches. People chose sides in this complicated mess that was the United States in those post-war years. Instead of joining the cacophony of voices shouting opinions, Watros painted a canvas that holds a mirror up to American society and asks, What does it mean to be made in the image of God? Harry Watrous was an American painter who worked in the late 1800s and first half of the 1900s. Classically trained in France, his art spread across several genres, including landscapes, nocturnes, still lifes, and portraits. Born in San Francisco, his father struck it rich during the gold rush and then moved the family to New York City. Watchers had the luxury of studying and pursuing art without worrying about his finances. From the first, his talent was recognized and his art remained popular throughout his very long career. At a showing of his work when he was 80 years old, reviewers were still admiring, saying, Irritating all that he does is the strong and progressive spirit of the painter himself, a painter who has held fast to the principles in which he believes, yet who has never seemed to fall into inelastic, ossified rote, never really to have grown old. The work we are going to be examining today is the only one Watros ever did that addressed a moral and social justice issue. If we were passing this work in a museum, at first glance, we appear to have a pretty family scene. The wife sits in her lovely dress, the handsome husband looks up from his newspaper, and the charming young girl gazes at her mother. Watchers has created an appealing family portrait, and one could easily glance at the work and walk on. I suspect that is what most people do. But if we stop to look, we will see that the scene is not idyllic, but fraught with an underlying tension. If we glance at the title of the work, The Drop Sinister, well, what does that mean? Displayed in 1913, The Drop Sinister is, in many ways, similar to the other works of Watros. He was known for his enigmatic, sophisticated women. Watros created mystery by clothing them in dark colors and showing only their profiles. He has done the same thing here with this mother in our family grouping. The mother is staring blankly ahead. Her face is shaded and seen in profile. We can't tell what she's thinking, but if we look carefully, we will notice the tension in her arm and particularly her hand and neck, the blank staring expression of her face. The young child, as children do, has sensed her mother's mood and is concerned. Her wide-eyed gaze is searching for the reason her mother is distressed. The father is black. He is not looking at his family, but gazing out at the viewer with a resigned expression on his face. It's as if he knows the emotion his wife is feeling, but has accepted it. He's wearing a clerical collar, reading a Christian newspaper with his Bible in front of him. So we assume he's a pastor home after a long day. He's exchanged shoes for slippers, removed his glasses, and tiredly rests his head on his hand. His gaze is direct, challenging us as the viewer to step into his world. The year is 1913, just 48 years since the end of the Civil War. The Drop Sinister is considered the first American painting of an interracial couple and their mixed-race child. 
As I ponder this work, I wonder if the father has just read something in his paper that has upset his wife and left him with this tired, resigned expression. I can imagine him saying, here we go again. Is he reading an opinion piece on the Negro problem? Perhaps a new piece of legislation has been submitted to Congress. Maybe it's just reprinting of a sermon on the topic of race. Being an interracial couple at the turn of the century would have been fraught with controversy, even danger. More than that, it must have been exhausting. At the center of this work is the child. Once we realize that we're looking at an interracial couple, a few pieces of the puzzle fall into place, and then more questions are raised. First, the child has blonde hair. Genetically, and genetics were at the center of the race debate during these years, a blonde child means both parents have some white ancestry. Since this work was first exhibited, there has been a lot of debate about the racial mix and or purity of the parents. Many viewers assume the mother was white. Others, as we will see, believe that she, like her husband, was mixed. Both mother and daughter, though, can pass as white. But their position is precarious, and in many ways, their identity hard to define. I believe the mother's tension and alarm is due to concern for her daughter and what she is going to face in life. How will this child's life be altered due to having black blood? The child's father is resigned to the difficulties. Her mother is distraught. The child is confused. When the painting was first exhibited publicly, it created a stir. The American Art News, calling the drop sinister one of Watrous's best canvases, noted, Harry W. Watrous preaches and paints an interesting sermon on the Negro question. And this study in the fruits of miscegenation caused an extraordinary amount of discussion. Residents of one typically southern city threatening to wreck the art museum if it was shown there. The theme of the painting is identity and what defines us as people. In the larger society of 1913, race defined people in inflexible and artificial ways. Watrous through this painting questioned that definition. Behind the family over the mantle is a verse from the book of Genesis. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Watrous is stating that identity is found in being made in the image of God. All of humanity, in all of its variety, reflects the image of God. Our understanding of race has changed, I hope, over the last hundred years. But at the time of this painting, and for centuries before that, scientists believed race was an inflexible identity marker. Each race possessed unchangeable traits. Of course, according to this scientific theory, the white race was superior, and as such needed to be kept pure, to not be diluted. These theories undergirded the justification for slavery, and after the Civil War, the Jim Crow laws. Those same theories fueled Hitler's belief that he could create a super race. Living during the times that we do of 23andMe, when we can easily check our DNA, we find that races are far more mixed than any of us could have predicted. We know now that race is a fluid concept and in many ways a social construct. If we're created in the image of God. I find this fluidity of race appropriate. God's image must reflect the many variations, colors, and beauty of humankind. Miscegenation is a term that is rarely used these days, but refers to interracial marriage. Many countries, including the U.S., have had complicated anti-miscegenation laws. They were not only laws regarding marriages between whites and blacks, but whites and Asians, whites and Native Americans, and also blacks and Native Americans, etc. The oddest one I came across was in Maryland, where it was illegal for a black to marry a Filipino. I don't know, that felt oddly specific. But the theme stands out. Races should not mix. As people became accustomed to living in the post-slavery world, the number of laws governing the interactions between the races increased. Whites felt threatened. There was a rising need by many to keep the status quo in place. The prevailing race theory stated that each race contained different genetics and that if you mix those genetics, it led to inferior genetic strains. And these theories were used to create laws that kept the white race pure and separate. Modern science has revealed that the human genome is remarkably consistent 
with racial differences making up only one one hundredth of a percentage point of our genetics. Race is more of a social construct than a scientific or genetic one, but those social constructs have proven themselves powerful. The Loving family was an interracial family and shortly after marrying, the couple was arrested. They lived in Virginia in the late 1950s. The judge ordered either prison time or that they move from Virginia for 25 years. So they moved to Washington, DC. Eventually, they wanted to return to their home and they reached out to then Attorney General Robert Kennedy, who connected them with lawyers from the ACLU. The ACLU took their case to the Supreme Court in 1968. And in a unanimous decision, the court struck down Virginia law. And this decision nullified the anti-miscegenation laws in 15 other states. However, it wasn't until the year 2000 that Alabama finally removed its own anti-miscegenation law. So given how recently we've been debating these laws, we can see just how strongly people cling to the idea that races need to remain separate. Often, humans retreat into a tribal mentality and identify themselves by those they exclude. Whites have traditionally defined themselves by who they are not. To be white means, in this time, to not even have a drop of Black, Asian, Native American, etc. blood in them. This is tragic in many ways, and Watchers focused on how this affected one family. More specifically, how it affects this one child. The blonde toddler caught tragically in a no man's land, left to question who she is and where she fits. Now, over the years, the U.S. Census Bureau has had the job of counting and categorizing people. Every decade, changes are made in the questionnaire that's used, and they reveal the politics, science, prejudices of that decade. Children of black and white couples have been the most debated and recategorized group over the decades of census data collection. The mulatto category was added to the census in 1850. That was because Josiah Knott, a self-proclaimed racial scientist and slave owner, wanted to collect data to prove that if you mix the races, you created genetically inferior children. His theory was that whites and blacks were actually different species. And in 1890, the racial categories included quadroon, which meant you were a quarter black, and octoroon, which meant you were an eighth black. Unsurprisingly, all of these designations were based on defining who is not white. Then in 1930, the rule was changed to a drop of blood. While this painting was completed well before that official change of 1930, the idea of one drop of Negro blood being enough to justify exclusion to social privileges was already well established. We can't say for sure What prompted Watros to paint this work? He could have been responding to discussions around the census, new laws regarding interracial marriage, or just offensive opinion pieces in the paper. But whatever the prompt, we know that this is the one time over a lengthy career that Watros chose to paint and exhibit a work that addressed a social and moral injustice. W.E.B. Du Bois, the Black civil rights activist and one of the authors of The Negro Problem, which was published in 1903, saw the sinister drop, and his comments on the painting sum up the tragedy. The people in this picture are all colored. That is to say, the ancestors of all of them, two or three generations ago, numbered among them full-blooded Negroes. These colored folk married and brought to the world a little golden-haired child, Today, they pause for a moment and sit aghast when they think of this child's future. What is she? A Negro? No, she is white. But is she white? The United States Census says she is a Negro. What earthly difference does it make that she is, so long as she grows up a good, true, capable woman? But her chances for doing this are small. Why? Because 90 million of her neighbors, good, Christian, noble, civilized people, are going to insult her, to seek to ruin her, and slam the door of opportunity in her face the moment they discover the drop sinister. I've always been intrigued by both art and literature as a vehicle for social protest. The subtlety of the storyline in a novel or a painting can draw us in and force us to consider a different perspective while our defenses are down. 
Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath brought to life the abuses suffered by farmers during the Dust Bowl. Banksy's satirical street art employs a dark humor to highlight injustices all around the world. Art has always had a subversive edge, questioning and challenging our understanding of ourselves, our identity, and our societies. Often, art does this by simply holding up a mirror. I feel that is what Watrous does here. He simply shows us an American family, a family struggling with their identity within a culture that rejects them. It can be painful to gaze into that mirror, to consider that the young girl is condemned before she has even begun to live because her blood contains the drop sinister. Watrous doesn't force his point. The canvas is not a dramatic emotional plea, but as we look at that child's face, we see that the culture we call our own has rejected her. Where does that leave us? Where does that leave her? The art critic Joseph Chamberlain, when he saw the drop sinister, remarked that it was one of those problem pictures which sometimes move the forces of modern life more powerfully than books or speeches do. This painting was first exhibited over a hundred years ago, and yet recent events have shown America still struggles with issues of race. Power, wealth, and status are still at the center. Tribal mentalities that encourage us to define ourselves by who we exclude still appeal. And artists continue to hold up a mirror so that we can see ourselves more clearly. Art can sharpen our vision and challenge us to consider what it means to be human, what it means to be made in the image of God. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like this video by giving us a thumbs up below and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss great commentary on classic works of art. KellyBagdanoff.com is your source for great content and curriculum, as well as devotional materials using the medium of art. Make sure you visit and subscribe. Pablo Picasso said, Art washes from the soul the dust of everyday life. So take a moment to share this video because art is too important not to share. See you later, alligator.